That's right, folks. You know what you clicked on this video for. After weeks of waiting, writing, and editing, it's finally time for my review of Kingdom Hearts 2. Oh, no, you f***ing don't. Whoa, calm down, calm down. Uh, calm down. You can't just skip straight to KH2. What do you mean? I did Shade of Memories already. It was the worst game I've ever played. You know I'm not talking about Recon. Then what? If we're getting 358 over two days. You know, the game that Roxas debuted in. Oh. Wait, but that game came out after KH2. Yeah, but it happens before KH2 in the timeline. Yeah, I'm gonna stick to release order. I'm not gonna change the way I do my videos just because you think I should. How about now? Ugh, fine. I have to. Yeesh, fans get more and more violent with each new game. Anyways, let's get on to Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days, otherwise abbreviated to Kingdom Hearts Days, or just Days. In Kingdom Hearts Days, a new enemy is added to the mix alongside a Heartless. When someone dies, their heart flies out of their body and becomes a black monster known as a Heartless, but they leave behind an empty shell. This shell becomes a white, person-like monster known as a Nobody, and if you're strong-willed enough, then instead of becoming a monster, your Nobody will look like you, and it can walk and talk and stuff. The only way to bring someone back is to destroy both the Heartless and the Nobody so that they can recombine inside Kingdom Hearts, and the original being can be reformed. All of this is revealed during Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days, but it's all important to understand the plot. Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days follows Roxas, the Nobody that Sora created when he committed Sudoku in Kingdom Hearts 1 to free Kyrie. Psst. Yeah, so I completely forgot to include that last part in the Kingdom Hearts 1 video. I know, I know, it's an incredibly important thing to forget, but I'll just say it now. In the first Kingdom Hearts game, when Darkness attacks Destiny Islands, Sora runs into a cave where he sees Kairi. Kairi is getting taken over by Darkness, and her heart flies over to Sora's for protection. Later on in Hollow Bastion, Riku tells Sora that Kairi is one of the princesses of heart, and that Kairi's heart is inside of Sora. Sora promptly then stabs himself with Riku's keyblade and frees Kairi's heart from inside of him, in the process turning himself into a heartless. It doesn't even matter, however, because a second later Kairi just hugs Sora the heartless and turns him back into a normal person. I'm not kidding. Even the wiki says that Kairi was somehow able to turn Sora back into a normal person. Anyways, sorry about forgetting that major plot point. I guess it just slipped my mind. Anyways, where was I? Ah, yes, days. Roxas is a nobody that the Organization 13 found in the middle of Twilight Town and recruited into their ranks. The organization is comprised of 13 nobodies with strong wills that are led by their leader, Xemnas, who, like Ansem, is trying to get to Kingdom Hearts. But instead of finding Kingdom Hearts, Organization 13 instead purposely defeats Heartless to take the hearts for themselves, hopefully to make a new Kingdom Hearts that Xemnas can use for themselves. 358 over two days tells the story of Roxas as he makes friends with two of the other members, Sol and Shion, and slowly discovers the organization and defects from it to go out on his own. Meanwhile, Shion discovers that she's actually a replica made of Sleeping Sora's memories, and her existence is slowly siphoning the other half of Sora's memories out of Roxas, therefore the life. To make matters worse, Sora actually can't wake up until Roxas and Shion are absorbed back into him. Shion decides that Roxas is more important and decides to pick a fake fight with him, which she intentionally loses and dies. There's a heartfelt goodbye as Shion begins to fade in Roxas' arms. She tells him that this is the best thing for both of them, and she fades away. Roxas absorbs the other half of Sora's memories from Shion, and Roxas becomes even more isolated and lonely than he was before. But here's the thing. Since Shion was a replica made out of Sora's memories, and technically not real, she kind of gets erased from all the memories of all the people who knew her, including Roxas. It's so sad, and probably one of the most tragic endings for someone in the entire franchise, right under the BBS trio. Let's, let's just have a moment of silence for Shion. Anyways, no time for that, because probably the most awaited battle in the entirety of Kingdom Hearts franchise is upon us, as Roxas makes his way to search for Heartless to set free in a new world called the world that never was. 
Riku, who has been in cahoots with Namine and trying to get Roxas to combine with Sora, also tracks Roxas down and is preparing for the Battle of the Ages. As he approaches the world that never was, Shion's voice echoes in his head and tells him that he needs to beat Roxas no matter what, at all costs. They begin their battle, and this is actually what the secret ending from Kingdom Hearts 1 was foreshadowing. This fight is one of the most epic fights in the entire series, and it includes Roxas wielding two Keyblades at the same time, and Riku catching one of Roxas' Keyblades strikes at full force with his left hand. Fun fact, throughout the entire rest of the series, up until Kingdom Hearts 3, Riku wears a brace on his left arm because that catch was so devastating and probably broke so many bones. Anyways, the fight reaches its climax and Roxas is about to beat Riku when Shion's voice echoes in his head and reminds Riku that he needs to win at all costs, no matter the cost. He lets out the power of Ansem's darkness and takes his form, and then proceeds to use Ansem's stand to beat Roxas into submission. And then, the fight is over. Diz, a scientist that's been working with Namine and Riku to find Roxas, puts Roxas inside of a data simulation of Twilight Town until he's strong enough to get back into Sora, and that is the end of the game. Look, I hate to disappoint all the people at home that wanted me to talk about Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days' amazing multiplayer mode, and the fact that you can play as multiple characters in the original DS version, but I don't actually have a DS. The way that I experienced this amazing game story as a movie on the Xbox 1.5 to 2.5 Kingdom Hearts game pack. What happened was that when they were porting 358 over two days and coded over to the Xbox, they decided that for those two games, it would be a lot better to include them as cutscene compilations. And it's so sad, too, because I also heard of how the missions and multiplayer modes of days were some of the most fun in the entire series, and I got really sad when I saw that I couldn't actually play them and could only watch them. So, it pains me to say that there's actually no gameplay section for this video of Kingdom Hearts 358 over two days. But please, if anybody out there knows the way that I can play this game right now without a DS, please let me know. Anyways, I gotta go take care of this guy. Okay, are we good now? Hmm, I guess, but I'm keeping an eye on you. Don't you dare try to skip a game ever again. You hear me? Yes, yes, I hear you. Now please, get out of my house. Okay, see ya. Jeez, that was a long tangent. But now we can actually get back to what this video is supposed to be about. Kingdom Hearts 2! This game wastes no time in throwing you straight into the game, but you don't actually play as Sora from the beginning, as he's currently stuck inside of a sleeping pod. You instead play as Roxas, still inside of the Data Twilight Town. Of course, we know who Roxas is because I literally just explained what 358 over 2 days was, but that game came out a whole four years after this game. So nobody playing the game when it came out would have any idea who Roxas is or why we should care about him. As Roxas nears further toward the end of his summer vacation, he begins to notice some glitches in the Matrix. Eventually, Roxas even meets Namine and Diz who tell him that he shouldn't exist and that he needs to fuse back with Sora. He even meets Axel who was told to kidnap him and beats him in a dual Keyblade fight that future Kingdom Hearts games will be calling back to in their intros for years to come. Finally, he reaches the Matrix control room and destroys it in a rage, before teleporting back to the real world and into Castle Oblivion, where he finds Sora. His life kind of flashes before his eyes, and Shion by second hand gets absorbed into Sora as well. I kind of feel bad for Roxas here, you know? I feel like he wasn't really given a chance at life. Let let's just all have a moment of silence for Roxas here. Well, no time for that, I'm afraid, because now that the depressing prologue is over, it's time to get back to the fun Disney game that I paid for. Wow, I can't believe to sing songs with the funny meerkat later. This is such a kid's game. Anyways, we cut back to Sora, Donald, Goofy, and Jiminy Cricket as they wake up inside the space pods with all their memories back. They leave Castle Oblivion and end up in Twilight Town, where they have absolutely no idea where they are. They begin walking down the street when they meet Hainer, Pence, and Olette. Roxas' friends, but the real versions that don't remember him. Sora, Donald, and Goofy ask them if they've seen Riku or the King, and they tell them that they haven't seen either of those two, but they did see a red-haired girl named Kairi. 
Sora freaks out because he didn't even know she was missing. He just thought Kairi was back at Destiny Islands, but apparently Axel had kidnapped her in another cutscene. They're about to start looking around town when the Dog Street Trio stops them and gives them a few items to help on their journey. A bag of money, identical to the bag of money that Roxas had earned with the fake friends in the Data World, and a piece of a trophy, also the same one that Roxas won with his Data friend. The main trio thanks them, and they run off to the train station to go look for more clues. But when they get to the train station, however, they're attacked by a bunch of nobodies. Of course, they don't know what nobodies are yet, and they still think they can fend them with their current gear. But when they do, their weapons go right through them. They're about to be defeated when Michael Mouse himself, in an Organization 13 coat, jumps down to beat away the nobodies. Everyone is shocked to see him, but Michael tells everybody that there's no time and they need to get into the train station and get on the blue train. And then he jumps away. Sora, Donald, and Goofy walk into the train station and get on the magic train, which takes them to this tower in the middle of nowhere. And at the foot of the tower, they see Pete the Cat standing at the footstep, trying to peek inside. They ask him what he's doing, and he says that he's looking for people to turn into Heartless for his master Maleficent. They break the news to him that they actually defeated Maleficent in the first game, and he is shocked by the news. He runs away, and the trio go inside to the castle where they meet Master Disney, I, I mean, Yen Sid, and uh, he tells them that he used to be Mickey's Keyblade teacher. Master Yen Sid then goes on to explain all the exposition about the series so far, about how when someone dies, not only does their heart become a heartless, but their empty shell of a body becomes a nobody. And also, if you have a strong will, then your nobody will look like you, and it can walk and talk and stuff. You know all of this stuff. I, I already explained it. Anyways, the old master then tells them to go into the next room where the three fairies are waiting for them. And the girls make Sora, Donald, and Goofy new armor to fight the nobodies. Also, in this game, Sora can sacrifice one of his party members in order to achieve a form, like Valor form or Wisdom form. But I'll talk about all that stuff in the gameplay part later. Now, there is... Only one part of the story left before the group moves on to the Dizzy shenanigans, and that is they need to revisit Hollow Bastion. When they arrive, however, the Final Fantasy VII crew has actually rebuilt most of the place into Radiant Garden, the place that it was before it was taken over by Darkness. Basically, they just need to go inside and meet a bunch of people, say hi, and then leave. Don't worry, this isn't the only Final Fantasy content of this game. We'll be revisiting Hollow Bastion later in this game for some more epic visits with an amazing fight. The next portion of the game is just Disney movies that don't really add anything to the main story like always, but there are a few interesting character interactions. For example, there's a Mulan world in this game, but as you might recall, Mushu was actually a summon in the first game, so when you meet him in the Mulan world, he actually responds by saying that he remembers you, and goes on to tell Ping, I mean Mulan, no Ping, about all the amazing enemies they face together, and how he single-handedly took down hordes of hurdles all by himself, to which Sora remarks that none of that is true. I mean, unless you did that weird magic, magic stock thing, which was a speedrun strategy, in which case he absolutely was not lying, but... Uh, in this case, he is. Anyways, that's just the sort of thing that I like in a video game. Moments like that can make or break a video game. Anyways, after the shenanigans are all over, Sora, Donald, and Goofy return to Radiant Garden, where they find Ansem's old computer and get sucked inside to, strangely, find the Tron world. Halfway through, they leave the console and find Michael Mouse, who tells them some exposition about the Door to Darkness and Ansem that he recently found out. Apparently, and I'm going to need you to pay attention to this, there are three Ansoms. There was a great scholar and teacher named Ansem who had 13 apprentices. One of the apprentices, Xehanort, turned on Ansem, kicked him out of the office, killed the other 12 apprentices, and then himself. And all of their nobodies became Organization 13. Xehanort's nobody became the leader of Xemnas, and his Heartless became Ansem, the villain for the first game. Whew, Okay. They go back inside to finish the Tron world, but this time when they leave, Squall from Final Fantasy tells them that the nobodies have been invading and they need to go stop them. Sora, Donald, and Goofy venture through Radiant Garden. This is when all hell breaks loose. First, the party needs to fight an Organization 13 member named Demix. Now, if you ask any player who has ever fought Demix in the original Kingdom Hearts 2, they will tell you that the fight is absolute hell. The reason for this isn't actually because of Demix being strong, but more for the fact that he cheats. 
For starters, in this fight, Demix has a reaction command that you can activate, which makes you tap him on the shoulder, but as soon as you do this, Demix turns around, whacks you with his guitar, and instantly kills you. The second hack he uses is that halfway through the fight, he'll activate a minigame, in which he'll make water clones of himself, named Dance Water Dances, and you have 10 seconds to beat them, all before you lose the fight. Granted, in the Final Mix version, Kingdom Hearts actually gives you 15 seconds instead of 10, so it's not actually the hard now. But, back then, that 10 seconds was way too little to beat every single one of his dance water dances, and it was enough to make hundreds of dedicated Kingdom Hearts players rage, and even more players quit. Anyway, after that, there's a cutscene in which Michael joins the party, and this is where shit gets real. Above the party, on a high cliff, one of the Radiant Garden's security systems fire, setting a rock down at Michael's head, so Goofy jumps in front of it to save him, and... LOOK OUT! Goofy! Goofy dies. Michael and Donald are devastated and run off to beat up more Heartless for revenge, and Sora soon follows suit. What follows is an awesome series of events where all the Final Fantasy characters team up with Sora to defeat wave after wave of nobodies until he reaches the summit. And waiting for Sora at the bottom of the mountain is, and I am not kidding, 1,000 Heartless. Sora fights 1,000 Heartless. After that absolute trial, Donald and Mickey meet up with Sora, and they lament over Goofy's death for a grand total of three seconds before he comes running down the hill to meet up with them. Michael asks Goofy how he survived the rock from earlier, and he simply says that he's been given so much head trauma in his life that one little rock from a mile above flying down at his head from a speed of 100 miles an hour just doesn't really phase him anymore. <laughs> uh, anyways, together, the whole group continues on, and they finally meet one of the main members of Organization 13, Saix. They confront him and ask him where he's keeping Kairi, and he simply tells Sora that if he gets on his knees and begs, he just might tell him, leading to one of the most infamous scenes in the entire Kingdom Hearts franchise. So you really do care for her? In that case, the answer is no. Saix tells Sora no's anyway, and dips. The whole group then needs to escape Radiant Garden through a portal, but they're followed by some nobodies. Sora, Donald, and Goofy are getting cornered when they are saved by Axel from Organization 13, who sacrifices his life to save Roxas inside of Sora. And after that traumatic experience, the game actually does something interesting. Instead of making more Disney worlds to account for the other hundreds of Disney properties they own, the developers opted for second visits. You see, after the second time they go to Hall of Bastion, all the worlds you just cleared will unlock, and you need to repeat everything you just did. So, if you thought that exploring some of the worlds ended in a bit of an unsatisfactory ending, this is why. Anyways, after the second visits, Sora, Donald, and Goofy go back to Twilight Town where they find an underground Matrix console, and with the help of Pence, they're able to enter it and find the world that never was. And folks, we're in the end game now. This is where all the characters converge. SDG, Riku, The King, Kairi, Diz, and Organization 13. All of them in one spot. Sora, Donald, and Goofy go through the tower and defeat the remaining organization members. Riku, who still looks like Ansem because of 358 over two days, breaks Kairi out of prison and gives her a keyblade that he apparently just had with him. And Michael and Diz, who is apparently the original Ansem the Wise in disguise, goes on a mission to download Kingdom Hearts to their external hard drive. Sora, Donald, and Goofy fight this guy named Zigbar, he's important later so don't forget him, and they meet Riku and Kairi, whose reuniting is actually really, really heartwarming, especially considering how the last time they were all together was in the middle of Ragnarok on Destiny Islands. The whole party meets up with Michael and Ansem, whose machine explodes, killing Ansem and turning Riku back to normal for some reason. Ansem did say anything could happen. And the whole group walks up to Xemnas' front door. Oh wow, this is gonna be so awesome. I've never had Kairi or Michael as a party member before. I can't wait to see what they can do. 
damn it. Anyways, Sora cuts a building in half, Zemnis turns into a boat, Riku is a party member, and Zemnis is defeated for approximately one minute until he comes back, sucks Riku and Sora into a weird in-between world for one final fight. It includes reaction commands, air combos, a segment where you play as Riku, and at the very end, Zemnis surrounds the duo with hundreds of mini lightsabers and begins to throw them. The player mashes buttons to deflect them, and Sora shoots Zemnis through the chest with a similar beam to the one that Kingdom Hearts used to kill Anthem in the first game, and the day is saved. Right? Well, Riku and Sora are actually still trapped in the in-between world with no way to escape since they just killed a Zemnis. And, since they don't know what to do, Sora puts his arm around Riku and they just kind of start walking without a goal. Eventually, they see something in the distance, and when they get closer, they see a light. There's a huge flash, and Sora and Riku are transported into the Land of Darkness. And when they arrive, however, they're met with a cave of sorts. Of course, Kingdom Hearts fans would recognize this place, as it appears very often in the franchise. But for now, this is the first time that we're seeing it. It's been a couple of hours, and Sora and Riku are just sitting at the shore, admiring the sounds of waves crashing by and it's actually pretty peaceful. Especially when you factor in that these two have been on a non-stop journey to help the universe against darkness for the past two and a half years of their lives. Eventually, they see another door in the distance, and recognize it as the door to light. And this time, when they walk through it, it transports them to the shores of Destiny Islands, where Michael, Donald, Goofy, and Kyrie are waiting the budget for this cutscene skyrockets, and you actually see curved lines in the game for once in the entire runtime. The game ends on a happy note that Sora, Riku, and Kairi are finally reunited as friends on Destiny Islands, and they stay there to continue living out their days, happily without a care. Donald, Goofy, and Michael go back to Disney Castle and do the same there, and that is when the credits roll. You would think that was it, right? Well, no. Akin to the first game, there's a secret cutscene at the end of the credits, where the Destiny Trio are just hanging out on the island, when they see a bottle come to shore, with a note with Michael's symbol on it, the inside. We don't actually see what was written on the note, but Sora looks very excited when he sees it. And that is when the game actually ends, on a god dang cliffhanger. Oh my god, that took so long. Seriously, I'm writing this script right after finishing the story part, and I'm 90% sure that, that entire section was at least the length of my entire first video. Whew, okay, 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 roll it back. Okay. Whew, alright. So, the gameplay in Kingdom Hearts 2 actually does have a pretty drastic difference from the first game. In Kingdom Hearts 1, the magic system was that you had a certain amount of magic tic tacs on the side of your screen, and by equipping better keyblades and better equipment, you could increase the maximum number of tic tacs you could collect by hitting enemies. In this game, however, they changed everything. Instead of having magic tic tacs, Kingdom Hearts 2 implements a single blue granola bar of magic. Using magic will deplete the bar, and using cure magic will completely deplete it, and once you use it up, the granola bar will turn pink and begin to refill itself. During this period of time that it's refilling, you cannot use magic at all, and once it does refill, it will turn blue again, and you can use your magic to your heart's content. It's a pretty drastic change, but other than Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop Distance, this is basically how all the rest of the games play out. Personally, I like the first game's magic system better, but I digress. Okay, now let's get to the juicy stuff. This game has the implementation of reaction commands. Now, technically, the first game did also have reaction commands with Ars Arcanum, Strike Raid, and Ragnarok. But this game uses reaction commands as its main gimmick. Instead of just little things you can equip to almost every single enemy in this game has their own unique reaction command. So, I'll just list off a few. Uh, the main squiggly white nobody has a reaction command called Reversal, where you spin around and hit from behind. The laser heartless in the 1000 heartless battle has a reaction command where you grab it and use its laser against it and all the other heartless around you. And the building has a reaction command where you cut it in half. Also present in this game are drive forms, which are simultaneously both the best and worst decision that Square Enix ever made with this franchise. Drive forms allow you to sacrifice Donald Goofy, or both of them at the same time, to perform a costume change that gives you better stat boosts. 
There's Valor Form, where you sacrifice Goofy and you get two Keyblades, better attack and higher jump. Wisdom Form, where you sacrifice Donald and get awesome gun Keyblades, better magic and floaty powers. Limit Form, my personal favorite, where you sacrifice nobody and get all of your present magic abilities turned into Limit Forms from the first game. Master Form, where... Uh, uh, I, I actually can't remember anything about this form. <laughs> I guess I never really used it that much. Huh. Anyways, then there's Final Form, where you get, and follow me on this one, better attack and magic, flight powers, not one, not three, not four, but two Keyblades that you control with your mind. The dry forms in this game are a very cool addition, yes, but there's also the bad part, where, as in the first game and all subsequent games, you just level up your movement by gaining XP and they'll just increase over time. In this game, however, your movement is directly linked to the dry forms, and if you want to level up your high jump, for example, you need to go out of your way to level up your valor form, because that's how you get it. But, unlike leveling up regularly during the game, this isn't something that you can just do on the side in a regular playthrough. Leveling up your dry forms is something that you need to do separately, grind it out if you want to get the better versions of your movements unlocked by the end of the game. Heck, you don't even get to use high jump in the first place before you get valor form leveled up at least once or twice. Now, take final form for example. You unlock it in the very last world of the game. This means that if you use the form somehow in every single battle from the moment you've got it till the moment you end the game, it would still be too short of a time to level up your glide to its maximum potential. Granted, you don't actually need to have your dry forms leveled up to max to beat the game, but still, something as essential as high jump or air dodge shouldn't be relegated only to those without more to do in their lives than play Kingdom Hearts games. Now, if I had any input on this whatsoever, I would have made it so that you already had the base movement unlocked as soon as you get the form, and if you want better than that, you'll have to go out of your way and level it up. Okay, I know your brain probably just did a pop socket considering how the past paragraph of this essay was about how dry form level up equal bad, but having the movements already available from the start and having the better options just available to the players who want it is a much better option than being completely forced against your will to do it to get the baseline versions of the abilities in the first place. The worlds in Kingdom Hearts 2 are... Twilight Town, the world that Roxas lived in when he was in the Matrix. Hollow Bastion, or now rebranded to Raiding Garden. Land of Dragons to represent Mulan. Beast Castle to represent Beauty and the Beast. Acre Wood to represent Winnie the Pooh. Olympus Coliseum to represent Hercules. Disney Castle to represent the world that Mickey, Donald, and Goofy are from. Oh my good back! Timeless River to represent the Steamboat Willy era of Disney animation. Wow. 
Atlantica to represent My Little Mermaid. Port Royal in order to represent the Pirates of the Caribbean. Agraba to represent Aladdin. <laughs> Halloween Town to represent Nightmare Before Christmas. Pride Lands to represent the Lion King. Space Paranoids to represent Tron. And finally, the world that never was, another Kingdom Hearts original world. And now, as you might have noticed, most of those worlds were actually returning worlds from Kingdom Hearts 1. And you'd be right. Olympus Coliseum, Halloween Town, Agrabah, 100 Acre Wood, and Atlantica are all returning from Kingdom Hearts 1. But, as you may not have noticed, Land of Dragons, Beast Castle, and Pride Rock are all worlds that were associated with people who appeared in the first game. Other than Beast Castle, all of the new worlds are actually just worlds of the summons from the first game. As, after Kingdom Hearts 1, all the worlds were restored and they got to go back. Now, as for Beast Castle, this is a special case because Beast didn't appear in the first game as the summon. He was a character that Sora met in Hollow Bastion while trying to traverse through it. As for Port Royal and Space Paranoids, those were just two live-action movies that Disney recently made and they wanted to see if they could put them in Kingdom Hearts. They don't actually have any historical significance. Also, as you might have noticed, Atlantica is on this list. So... How did, you, that, how did they fix all the problems from the first game? Answer, they didn't. Whereas in the first game, people hated the execution of the dodge button and the underwater combat. In this game, the entire world is relegated to two rooms and about three hours worth of rhythm games. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I were kidding. It's kind of like if Disney listened to everybody's complaints about Atlantica and Kingdom Hearts 1 and just decided to do the funniest thing they could think of. Oh, you don't like the combat of Atlantica? Okay, how about we get rid of it and replace it with something ten times more tedious and annoying? Oh, you don't like how expansive and confusing the exploration of Atlantica is? How about we make it two rooms? There! No more tedious exploration. I just kind of find that really funny. <laughs> As for the gummy ship section of Kingdom Hearts 2, it's actually pretty similar to the first game. In order to get to different worlds, you must go through these locked gray doors. And behind each door, there's a section where you need to hop aboard your gummy ship and defeat multiple hordes of Heartless whilst racking up a score. I don't really know where to go from here when talking about the gummy ship sections because I sort of feel like everything that I needed to say about them was said in the first Kingdom Hearts 1 video. Uh, so I'll just say that they included bosses in the minigames, so now it's a tad bit more exciting when a surprise ghost ship shows up on your way to Mulan. Just like Kingdom Hearts 1, Kingdom Hearts 2 received a final mix version when it was ported onto newer consoles. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure of how much of this stuff was actually in the original game and was only added later in the final mix version, so I'm just going to list all of it. After you finish Kingdom Hearts 2, if you return back to Hollow Bastion, there will be a strange new site. There will be a spot in the ocean given out where there will be a platform at the bottom with 13 doors. Each of the doors leads you to a different fight with a souped up version of of Organization 13 fights. This is an awesome little easter egg at the ending of Kingdom Hearts 2 that is really just there for the people to test their strength in the game. Also for randomizers to test out how crazy they can truly get things. Also, like in the first game, collecting every single material in the game will allow you to craft the ultimate weapon. In this game, not only is the Keyblade even more busted, but it's a different color too. 
Finally, completing every single thing that this game has to offer, which means collecting every single material, defeating every single boss fight, defeating every main story, getting S ranks on every single Atlantica song, and more. You will have completed Jiminy's journal, and you will unlock a secret cutscene and the boss fight. Remember how at the end of Kingdom Hearts games, the budget increases a thousandfold, and there's an awesome cutscene where everybody meets up again, and it's just a real smooth round faces for everybody, and it's a good time? Well, in this game, the secret cutscene gets that same treatment. Now, what I may not have mentioned is that deep inside the Disney castle, there's a portal to the basement. This portal leads you to the secret boss fight. This boss fight is the hardest in every single Kingdom Hearts game. It leads you to the Lingering Will, or Loa for short. This boss fight is insanely hard. You won't even believe it. This person in a suit of armor is stronger than you, faster than you, has more health than you, has three different one-hit kill moves. He doesn't just beat you with his Keyblade. He blinks and nullifies the concept of your entire existence. Anyways... Um, this boss fight was even harder than Sephiroth in the first game. But, you may be asking, what does this have anything to do with that secret cutscene you were talking about? Well, in that secret cutscene, you see the Lingering Will himself, along with two other Keyblade wielders in similar armor to him, fighting an old man and an evil Keyblade wielder. Now, when this game came out, much like uh, the secret cutscene in Kingdom Hearts 1, it was a reference to the next game to come, Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep, and it even said so at the beginning, with a teaser to the next game. But, of course, when this game came out and people finally saw the secret cutscene, nobody knew what it meant. Of course, we got answers later, six years later, when Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep was actually revealed to be a game, and it was released. But, that's a story for another time. In conclusion, Kingdom Hearts 2 was a game about familiarity. It brought back so many characters and worlds from the previous game, some that we liked and some that we really, really did not. But at the same time, it still did an amazing job of expanding the universe that we love. For many people, Kingdom Hearts 2 is the best installment in the series, and I can honestly understand that perspective. To be honest, if Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance didn't exist, this would probably be my favorite game too. But I'm getting ahead of myself again. Thank you all so much for watching. At the time of recording, it's currently February 20th, 2023. So I was obviously not able to get this out in time for New Year's. But better late than never, I guess. <sighs> but seriously, thank you so much for watching this video and supporting my channel. After all the people in the comments of the last video telling me to do more, I was legitimately motivated to continue. So please, keep supporting my channel just by watching them, and if you want to see more video essays like this, please be sure to like the video and subscribe so that YouTube knows. And if you know anybody else who would like the same kind of content, please be sure to send this to them too, along with my two other video essays about Kingdom Hearts 1 and Chain of Memories. Anyways, without further ado, that is the end of this video, and goodbye!